On our first episode of the Lamberton Racing Pigeons podcast, Dr. John Lamberton discusses how Lamberton Racing Pigeons began. started with pigeons in the 1960s, uh, approximately 61, when I changed junior high schools and met a new friend and was over at his house in the backyard when I heard this cooing noise. And I went to see what the noise, where the noise came from. And uh, my new friend had these beautiful pigeons, racing pigeons, homing pigeons, in this uh, open-faced loft. And as I looked in, I just remember being marveled at how beautiful they were and the wonderful cooing sound and it was so peaceful and serene and I just remember that all of that touched me somewhere deep, deep inside and kind of awakened some of the stories that my grandfather used to tell about the Lamberton family in Scotland and Ireland and so I've always had a fascination with Europe and because the modern day sport of racing pigeons has come primarily from Europe and primarily from Belgium, uh, secondarily Holland. You know, that the, all that history and, and uh, the sport of racing pigeons was very appealing to me, and the birds themselves were very appealing to me. So my friend told me where he first purchased his racing pigeons, and it was from a wonderful f- local fancier in Tulsa, Oklahoma, by the name of Keith Perrette. And... Uh, Keith had old-fashioned weggies and old-fashioned bricos. Some people call them bricous, but uh, from Dr. Bricou or Dr. Brico uh, in Germany, I believe. Or for, uh, I'm not sure about that. But uh, they were the old type of hardy, steady racing pigeon. And Keith... Perrette flew with the north course in Tulsa, which meant they were flying from race stations to the north of Tulsa. And Tulsa and Oklahoma primarily have southern winds, so it meant that most of the races were into a headwind. I'd say 75 to 90 percent of the races were headwind races. And so the pigeon fanciers at that time had the old steady breeds, Sion's, Ricos, Waggies, Stasserts, Dordans that were that came from the older racing pigeon fanciers in Europe and were imported into the United States and were perfect for uh, this particular North Course. We also had a couple of clubs that flew out of the South, and those races obviously were primarily tailwind races. And it seemed like it took a little different type of pigeon to fly from the south than it did from the north. Uh, I went and bought a pair, uh, gave $25 for uh, a blue male and a silver silver female uh, that were from Mr. Perrette's best pigeons. And I remember him telling me that when you have a blue male and a red female, that the babies most of the time come out the opposite color of their parents. So this pair had red males and blue females. And so that was kind of uh, the genetic uh, coding of the color was sort of interesting to me too with my first pair of pigeons. And I uh, bought an old building from about a block away from my house and tore it down and dragged it down to my house uh, with my granddad's pickup truck. And... uh, reassembled it and that was my first loft and it worked it functioned pretty well I didn't know anything about building a loft I was um, 14 15 years old and even though uh, my parents and my grandfather let me drive the truck right in the neighborhood there I wasn't of driving age but uh, they allowed me to drive the truck in order to uh, pull the loft from its first location to our backyard and um, so that was about 1961, and I was about 14 years of age. And I read everything I could about 
racing pigeons and about what was going on in Europe. And uh, in the United States, there used to be an, uh, an old newspaper, kind of, uh, or the original magazine. And I think it was called the Racing Pigeon News. I'm not sure exactly what the name was. I've, I've probably got a couple of old ones, and I'm sort of <clears throat> having a senior moment as to what it was called, but it was called the Racing Pigeon News. And I remember uh, reading about this young pigeon fancier by the name of Mike Gannis that uh, was still a teenager, I think, at the time, late teens, but was uh, an up-and-coming person in the racing pigeon sport. Uh, he's a very uh, inquisitive young man that had a natural gift with pigeons. And uh, Mike, uh, it showed the article in the Racing Pigeon News showed a picture of Mike and his loft, Gannis family loft, and uh, when it far earlier than it is now, so it, it looked much differently. In fact, it may be at a different location than Mike is now. But I remember reading about Mike and and feeling that he had the same passion about pigeons that I did. So I called him, and we struck up a friendship. And I purchased ten young birds from him uh, that were primarily Jansons. They primarily came uh, from Rene Trien, uh, who is a fancier, uh, more or less, in Belgium. And Rene used to do chores for the Jansen brothers. He used to, I think, do some of their banking and running errands and different things. And so the, the brothers would pay him in pigeons. He, so even though Rene didn't race pigeons himself, he had this incredible loft of Jansen pigeons that were gifts or payment really from the Jansen brothers to him for all these chores and they migrated uh, I think through some of them through Bob King uh, and uh, from Fond du Lac Wisconsin and eventually to Mike and these are the pigeons that uh, I introduced to my old stock of Weggies and Bricos and I introduced these Jansen's uh, from Mike and these new types of pigeons were far more suited to the southern course than the northern course and I liked the grit and the hardiness of the pigeons that flew the northern course into the headwinds but I ended up uh, flying with the southern group because they had more young people in it. Do you remember your first race? The, the first one I remember was our thousand mile race from Orlando, Florida. And this race was sponsored and kind of pushed by George Goswick. And George Goswick is a legendary national, old-time national pigeon fancier. He has passed on, I believe. But George wrote a book called Living with the Birds, which is a classic uh, book that he wrote. And he holds primarily, I think, still some 700 to 1,000 mile race records, uh, or he's still mentioned anyway in terms of those results nationally because George was a tremendous long distance fancier. And so I wanted to be like George and, and fly the thousand mile race. And I remember sending, I think, four of my best pigeons uh, to the thousand mile race and uh, never seeing them again. Mm -hmm. So it was tremendously disheartening and devastating to uh, not have my pigeons come back and I remember that being kind of a pivotal point for me that I never again wanted to feel that feeling of waiting and waiting and waiting for pigeons and them never coming home so at that point I really decided to redouble my efforts to learn more about the sport to work harder with the birds and to at least get the birds to come home. I, at that point, I didn't even care about winning. I was, I first started just caring about getting my pigeons home. So with that, I became closer friends with, with Mike Gannis. And when Mike decided to organize uh, his first uh, multi-person trip to Belgium, uh, I was luckily one of the five people that went. And... Uh, Dominic Rapucci, myself, Dominic, and uh, two others that uh, Bob Brummagen was, was one, and Danny Van Lake was the fifth one. And so we all went to 
uh, Belgium, and Mike filmed that. And today, I think he still sells his first video, uh, which he filmed while the five of us were in Belgium visiting lofts. On episode two of the Lamberton Racing Pigeons podcast, we'll hear about the story of the trip to Belgium. I want to thank James Payne for our audio equipment, and thank you all for listening. We'll see you on the next episode.